Okay, so it sounds like we have, uh, the less I talk, the quicker we get to the drinks, so this is my sister. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is my sister Cindy, the person here who's known me the longest, and she'd like to share with you some of the family perspective. With the help of several fabulous people, I've put together a very brief video in celebration of my brother. I hope you all enjoy it. As Joe was about to graduate, I ran into Edward Teller. He told me that my boy Polchinski had been awarded a Hertz Fellowship. I said how pleased I was. And Edward said, well, the committee had talked about it. And though they realized Joe was never going to make an impact on weapons development at Livermore, they felt that if they didn't give him one, at some time in the future they would have looked awfully stupid. Well, I disagreed with Edward on all sorts of things, but in that respect, he was completely correct. They would have looked awfully stupid. Happy birthday, Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Joseph Polchinski. One of the things that's always impressed me about Joe is just how damn unassuming he is. He's about as far from a pompous academic superstar as you could possibly imagine, and he's always been that way. One of the silly things we would discuss, for instance, when we were undergraduates was Nobel Prizes, and at the time we thought that Nobel Protocol required that you, after receiving your prize from the king, you back down the steps. Joe swore he would never do that, but he went further than that and said that should the opportunity arise, he would request chocolate pudding. You all know that chocolate is Joe's favorite flavor. He would request chocolate pudding for the Nobel banquet, which he would proceed to smear on his face. Good evening. Tom Thompson here. I guess I should start by uh, expressing my appreciation for being chosen as one of uh, the top 10 physicists that Joe admires in his life. Is that? Oh, I see. I guess my appreciation for being chosen as one of 10 people willing to make this video in Joe's life. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I will say that uh, hanging out with physicists is sort of like wearing a pair of glasses. You, you just hope that you look smarter uh, for having done so, but Joe, just want to say, Einstein might not be right. Think about it. Just think about it. Edward Teller was right to award Joe the Hertz Fellowship, but he was wrong to think that Joe did not have a possible future in weapons development. The older brother to Cynthia Ann, the Polchinski family lived in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and the Virgin Islands before settling in Tucson, where Joe enjoyed a typical 1950s boyhood dreaming about fighting Indians and fending off nightmares of nuclear Armageddon. Joe most enjoyed gazing up into the dark Arizona skies and identifying constellations. And in the seventh grade, Joe built himself an eight-foot telescope modeled on the equipment in use at Mount Palomar. Sister Cindy remembers the gregarious side of Joe and the romantic opportunities that his friends presented to her teenage self. I have to say, it's been really fabulous having Joe as a brother. It was especially good when I was in junior high and Joe was in high school, and he brought his friends over to the house. We've always had the coolest boys in high school at our house. We had the boys from the chess club, we had the hotties from the astronomy club, we had the really, really, really incredible boys from the physics club. 
was unbelievable having all of these cool boys at our house all the time. So Joe, I thank you for that. Undergraduate college was Caltech, the physics marines. Joe was anxious to sit at the feet of the great minds of his age, and was initially mad on math. Roland Lee was a fellow student and friend at Caltech, and knew very quickly that Joe Polchinski himself would become one of those great minds. We we all worked on the problem sets. You know, I was you know one of the lucky ones. I could always get the problems, but it would take me you know, like 10 pages sometimes. But Joe would just be sitting in the back of the lecture room. He'd have that big pen that he'd be chewing on. Sometimes he'd get pen on his mouth after, you know, chewing on the pen. And he'd be listening to the lecture, or maybe he not listening to the lecture, but at the end of that lecture, he would already have done the homework that was assigned that day for the next week. And uh, then he just put the uh, his homework in the uh, grader's box on his way out. And his homework was always just one page. It was, it was good because, you know, we went to Caltech to, you know, learn from, you know, the best professors, but actually what we learned was from our colleagues. And, uh, you know, I think what I learned from Joe is, you know, this is what genius looks like. At Caltech, Richard Feynman taught his famous physics X course, which wasn't really a course. It met, I guess, at 5 p.m., sometime in the early evening, and there was only a couple of rules, or ground rules, set down by Feynman. You could ask Feynman to explain any physics phenomena, but you couldn't ask him, for instance, how to solve problem three on your quantum mechanics homework. And Joe, I have to say, really distinguished himself in that course, well, by falling asleep in the front row uh, prominently splayed out, his head cast back, snoring rather loudly. Joe, we're uh, here at uh, Blacker House where you spent your undergraduate years, uh, where you were molded into the physicist you are today, and we're here at dinner time. I hope you remember what it was like, and I'm sure you had uh, many fine meals here, and the food, I'm told it's much better than it used to be. Let me just sample a little bit of it here. <laughs> Water, please. Okay, yeah, food's awesome, like it used to be, I'm sure, in your day. Anyways, you're famous at Blacker House for the prank that, uh, that you performed. What I understand, you stole the door to the roof access of the Millican Library. I think it's the 10th floor of the Millican Library. And it was a, it was a heroic effort. Particularly, you had to climb through an air shaft or something <laughs> to uh, get one floor above. After Caltech, Joe earned his Ph.D. from UC Berkeley, then did postdoctoral work at the Stanford-run Slack facility until 1982. He moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Harvard, staying until 1984, at which time he accepted an offer from the University of Texas, where he stayed until 1992. It was back during his Slack years that Joe worked with Stephen Park, two fresh green PhDs out to the conquer the world of physics. We worked hard and we partied hard. I remember your intensity and competitiveness, especially in sports and various video games. Pac-Man was all the craze. I always admired your ability to concentrate, especially with physics problems. I remember we gave you a Rubik's Cube and you worked to solve it day and night for two, maybe three days, non-stop. I never did manage to get you on the squash court where I could have shown you a thing or two. Joe has been an athlete all his life, and his sports are legion, 
but it's squash that Mark Wise recalls most vividly. I fondly remember first meeting you at uh, Harvard when we were first postdocs, and I remember thinking when I first started to talk you, with you, hey, that's a real smart guy. I better try to do some physics with him. And so as the years went on, we wrote a few uh, papers together. We, were, we wrote one on supergravity models for low energy supersymmetry. And one thing that most people probably don't know is that you actually wrote the code for solving the renormalization group equations while I was out tanning in the yard at, uh, at Harvard. We wrote a few papers together. Probably the least well known of them is uh, something titled On the Generality of the Mass Sum Rule. I think last time I looked that had zero citations, so perhaps I'm on your least cited paper. I think if you were not a physicist, you would be a professional sports player in some league somewhere, maybe the ice hockey league. A lot of the time that Joe and I spent together, uh, starting as undergrads at Caltech and then also in graduate school, was playing volleyball at Cal. Our intramural team twice won the championships, and one of the teams that we beat, and I admit we took considerable pride in beating, was a team that contained several varsity players from the Cal volleyball team. Joe played a big role in that, and that was due to his really rather impressive leaping ability. Some of us conspired to test Joe's leaping ability in a rather unusual way. After practice, we were standing in the gymnasium lobby, which had a suspended ceiling, and I suppose it was an eight-foot ceiling. We explained to him that we were testing a recent psychological observation that your body was physiologically unable to jump in a way that would strike a severe blow to your head against an overhead object. Joe looked at us like we were crazy, he said that's nonsense, and he proceeded to test the hypothesis experimentally, and he did so in impressive fashion, damaging three or four ceiling tiles in the process. And it's my working hypothesis that this blow to Joe's head while in free fall explains his strange attachment to firewalls. We played. We had a lot of fun, and I was trying to remember what happened, who won the most games, and I think, I think that I won all the games except for one. Or maybe it was you who won all the games except for one. Anyways, it's not really very important, so I thought you should know that I've been improving my game ever since we left. If I was to meet you today, there would certainly be no contest. I would just beat the pants off you. Joe met Dorothy Chun and they fell in love. Sharing so much in common, they married in 1980. Their two boys, Stephen and Daniel, were born while they were still in Texas. Joe Polchinski is a man of singular accomplishments. He has a deep understanding of not only the theoretical underpinnings of our physical reality, 
but also an understanding and appreciation for what makes us truly human. I have several stories, but one that is uh, close to my heart is the following. I had an accident in 1985, and I was at the hospital and bedridden at home. It took a while to uh, rehab. Joe took upon himself to get a blackboard. He brought the blackboard to my house, and then he held a bunch of lectures on string theory uh, in my house, and I will never forget that. The students were there, the postdocs were there, and it was, uh, it was great. Something that you might not know about Joe is that sometimes he gives really terrible advice. For example, Joe once told me that string theory was right, it was the theory of everything, but that it was just way too hard, and it would never go anywhere, and no one should work on it. Maybe he was just telling me that he thought I wasn't the right person for the subject. He said, Joe, go away, find something more useful to do, we'll never go anywhere. What's interesting is that the year was 1989 when Joe was probably in the process of writing his paper with Jin Dai and Rob Lee that introduced D-brains and orientifolds and helped to usher in the second superstring revolution. Joe stands like so few can, tall in the realm of the intellect, but also solidly in the corporeal world throwing himself against physical challenges of pavement and mountain. You know, one being things that I admire about Joe, I will say I've always been in awe of his fearless downhill writing skills. I know that I have neither the ability or nerve to keep up with you, Joe. You, you always drop like a stone, and I can't figure out how that works. Also, I know that uh, you love to lead the ride. I think you know what every pack dog knows is, that if you're not the lead dog, the scenery never changes, and uh, I appreciate your point of view there. Joe, my very best birthday wishes go out to you on this happy occasion, which I very much hope is a celebration of the midpoint of your career. Happy birthday, Joe. The students here at Blacker House want to give you their regards. Happy birthday, Joe. So happy birthday, and enjoy those senior citizen discounts. Happy birthday, Joe. Hope you have a good 60th birthday, and I hope you have another 60 years that's just as good. So be well, my friend.